thank you to the committee for their work. Um, it really is a behind the scenes, sometimes thankless job, but it's a lot of work that they do to get us to this point. Also thank you to the people that, that wrote letters on behalf of the people that are receiving awards, and I'm actually gonna share some snippets with you as I make the introductions. The complete award bios can be find, found in the Inseca journal, um, so instead of having me tell you all this stuff about these great people and take up all this time, you can just read the bio and I will just um, share with you some of the beautifully written words that were shared with us. We've got eight awards to give today, starting with two Fellow of the Council awards. So Fellows of the Council are people who have made outstanding contributions to, the, to NSICA as an organization. Um, you don't need to know the specifics, good standing member, but the first recipient of this award is Steve Hilton, who is an artist, academic, and the former NSICA program's director. This is from a letter um, about Steve. I often think of Steve as the proverbial duck swimming in a pond in which all you see is the smooth forward progress, never the furiously paddling feet below the surface. His constant gentle nature and sense of humor puts people at ease immediately. Even the most high-strung, frenetic individual can't help but feel more relaxed and centered in Steve's presence. So Steve Hilted, could you come up here on the stage, please? Now you guys who know me, you know why my neck is hurt. I have a herniated disc in my neck. There it is right there. There's really not going to be a slideshow, Mary Clunan, is there? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thank you, Patsy. And, and thank you um, to my mom and, and my family for being here. And, and uh, thank you for those who wrote letters for me. And thanks to Jim Iber, who who uh, nominated me. And I think that my, my uh, um, other mentor here, Vic Bassman, um, is here. Um, the person, he's the reason why I'm standing here. I was a science teacher for 15 years, and without Vic Bassman, I would still be a science teacher, so. Um, so it's really pretty appropriate that Patsy introduces me today because she's the one who got me into this. Um, Patsy and I have been friends now for 20 years, and uh, we met each other, we've known each other since she was an undergrad, and I was a grad student at Missouri State. Um, that was back when she um, was a skateboarder and had a shaved head, and it, it just, it, it kind of goes to show you that we can all grow up and be somebody, you know, so, so thanks, Patsy. Um, so... In 2004, my second in SICA, um, I was minding my own business. It was a Thursday afternoon. I had sensory overload, um, like we all do, and, and uh, um, I ran into Patsy and very naively asked her if there was something that I could do to help. And she said, well, no, I think we got this. And a few moments later, a little bit later, she said, well, you know, Steve, you could run for the student director at large, and because and, um, we need somebody uh, to fill that position. And, and 48 hours later, I was in a board meeting um, so, um, little did I know that I'd signed up for nine years of service to NSICA, because that's kind of what it's added up to uh, over the years. So, uh, when I was told I had to give a 7.32 minute talk um, here today, I, I didn't really know what I was going to say, and I still really don't know what I'm going to say. Um, no, I do. I have some things written down. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the amazing people that I've met and that I've worked with. Um, there are way too many to, uh, to, to recognize. I wanted to talk a little bit about or say something about mentors because um, that's why we're here. It's the part of this conference. Um, and service, it's so important to do service for the, for the uh, organizations that you, that you um, love and, and that bring us all here to be able to do this. Um, and, and I guess I, I could talk a little bit about how, how some of you think it's glamorous to be on the board. Um, so I see how you guys look at our name tags as board members with our little, um, our little ribbons down there and you, you have name tag envy. Um, but it's, it's, that was a joke. I'm glad somebody got it. Um, you know, we, we, uh, um, 
we work pretty hard. And, and just to give you an idea about um, why maybe you shouldn't have that name tag envy, when I started as the student director at large, um, one of my, actually my major role was to put together the regional Jurge student exhibition. And what that amounted to was receiving several great big boxes of slide um, sheets and taking all those slides and putting them into carousels and then putting, typing up um, a, a spreadsheet that I put together in a little book that I sent the juror so that, so that she or he could juror the show. That sounds pretty glamorous, doesn't it? And then the boxes and, and all that stuff came back and then I had to put all those slides back into the, into the sheets and then mail them to all the people. Um, so it was educational and it was certainly fun um, because of some of the people that I got to meet, but glamorous it wasn't. Um, so, so after two years of being the student director at large, um, I, was, I was again a civilian. Or as one of my friends the other day, I like this better, he, he said, he said, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of nice to be a tourist um, now because after six years, I, I didn't really get to do a lot of what you guys get to do. And, uh, and so, so after two years as the student director at large, I, I, I had one year off. Robert Harrison is sitting out here. Um, after having a year off, he calls me and says, Steve, um, we need you to take over the student director at large thing again because, because we need someone to put together the, the student show. And so I found myself um, back with slide carousels. Um, and, and then it happened again. Um, I was minding my own business, getting ready for Inseca 2009, Tempe, Arizona. And, and a friend, and a real friend and great mentor, Keith Williams, in Sika's then president-elect, calls me and says, um, yeah, Joe Molinero is not able to finish his term, and, and would you be, be willing to step up and, and do it? And, and, of course, he knows me, and, and I said yes. And, and, again, not really knowing what I was about to get myself into, but, but I did have my wife's, um, my wife's support and, and uh, my university support, so, so here we go again. And, Six years after I, my first in Sika, um, I found myself as the programs director of the largest arts organization on the planet. And I still find that kind of incredible. Um, and I'm not sure how it happened, but um, at the end of the day, I can only hope that, that there's truth in what my mentor and the guy who helped me start this, Joe, Joe Molinero, said. And he said it on more than one occasion. He said, Steve, the one thing you need to remember is to not be afraid to put your thumbprint on the programming for Inseca. And uh, this is your chance to make a real positive influence and, and to do something really important for the members. Well, I think that we did that, and, and I, I use we on purpose. I think we did put a thumbprint on, on the organization. I think, well, maybe at least a pinky finger um, print, but a, a print anyway. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm certainly positive, I'm absolutely positive that it's not just my thumbprint because of all the other people that were involved. Um, there's no way NSECA programming would be where it is today without the help of the incredible people that served with me on the board. Way too many to mention. The AV crew, which I will mention because they're incredible. Without the AV guys, um, our, our, our jobs as the program people and as the board, and, and you guys would not get to see and do what, what it is you get to see um, up on the, on the screen. So thank you to Tony, Lee, Chris, Ben, Robert, Matt, and now Paul, and, and thanks to the NSECA staff. Dory, if you guys only knew how hard these guys work, Dory, Kate, Helen, Jacqueline, Tammy, and Marco. Um, and then there's Josh Green, who without a doubt is, is the best leader and mentor I've ever had the, the honor to work, um, to work with. Um, he, he's, he's a leader that, uh, thank you. I, I, he's a leader that I would do anything um, to not disappoint. So, um, let's see, and uh, maybe a few of you guys know the incredible, that, that these, all these incredible people work tirelessly at Inseca throughout the year, but what you might not know is as soon as this is over, a week, a week of vacation later, they're right back at it again, and, and it's, it's incredible how, how hard they work. Um, they're, conscientious, they're as conscientious and hardworking as any group I've ever had the pleasure to work with. Um, so I'm going I'm to start to close with, um, with this. In the last few years, I've been asked a few times what I'm most proud of with my service to Inseca. And uh, it's pretty easy. It, it, it would be easy to talk about new programming strands that, that we came up with during my tenure, the student perspectives, 
the K-12 room, the process room, um, or, or we almost have twice as much programming now. Um, sorry, Dory, she, she's, uh, she, she works twice as hard now. Um, but without a doubt, I have to say the one thing I'm most proud of that I was able to, to do and finish in my total of nine years with Nsika um, is, is I did it without anybody really realizing how unorganized I am. Um, Maybe you guys were nice, or, or maybe I faked it well. Um, but to conclude, I'd like to say thanks to the leadership of Nsika, and, and I'd like to thank, say thanks to the membership for, for having uh, um, confidence in my ability and allowing me to serve. Thank you. Look at this, uh-huh, mister. Look at this, uh-huh, mister. Uh-huh, uh-huh, Mr. Gunn. Is that your dancing music, Steve? Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm okay with that. What do you say? Yeah. I'm going to hold it together on this one. Um, this is a posthumous award for Glenda Taylor, who is an artist, academic, oh, avid sports woman and bore many and seek a roles. Most recently, secretary and special presidential appointment from one of the letters. In Glenda's short 60 years, she exemplified everything that Nsika values in its members and respects in a ceramic artist and educator. She made the organization in the field better than she found it. She was an irreplaceable gear in the machinery of Nsika that made it work year after year. Here to accept her award uh, on her behalf is Wynne Wilbur. Uh, my name is Glenda Taylor. I'm from Topeka, Kansas. I've been a member of NSICA since 1977. Um, I was a director at large on the board from 2005 to 2008. And I was appointed as secretary in 2010 and served um, as secretary, was elected in 2011 until 2014. Um, so that's my story of my NSICA participation. Thanks to Cindy Rocker, actually, for we have several of these clips, and she helped me insert those into this. I want to say before I continue that the images that you're going to see are of Glenda's work, uh, and they're roughly chronological. Um, I am fairly, um, it's, it doesn't coordinate with what I'm going to say very often. Every once in a while they sync, but mostly I'm just going to talk about Glenda, and then her work will be um, in the background. So, so you can uh, kind of imagine that they, where they start. So Glenda Taylor and I met as freshman ceramics majors at Little Bethany College in Lindsburg, Kansas in the fall of 1972. It was such a small school that you might expect us to bond right away and since we shared the same major and there weren't very many other majors. But in reality, we really didn't know each other that well. When we graduated, I began teaching elementary art um, in a small Kansas town but she went on to get her MA at Emporia State University. We hadn't stayed in touch, but a year later, I got a call from Glenda asking me if she wanted, if I wanted to go to Nsika uh, in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, several students from Emporia were going, but she was the only girl and she needed a roommate. So uh, I said, sure, yeah, <laughs> that, that would be fun. Uh, I didn't have to think really twice about it. Um, our group, uh, drove across the Midwest uh, together. We, we toasted uh, champagne with champagne. We thought we were very clever when we did that. We went to the opening ceremonies quite inebriated. I don't remember anything about it, but um, we had an amazing and life-changing experience, not the least of which was the fact that Glenda and I really bonded at that uh, and became Nsika roomies for most of the rest of the time that we knew each other. We didn't always go to every Nsika after that, but, but when we did, we shared a room and we spent that time catching up with each other and, and finding out about you know, where our lives were going and what our work was like and, and all those great things that you do at Nsika. Glenda went on to Kansas State University where she earned her MFA in 1985 and began teaching at Barton County Community College, which is out in, in the western part of Kansas. She moved to Topeka, Kansas in 1987 to be with her husband, Joe, 
and started teaching at Washburn University where she served uh, as the department chair for much of that time. Glenda was not only a talented artist and a caring teacher, she was also an avid and gifted athlete. She was very active uh, in many things, but the outdoor thing that she loved the most was bicycle riding. She rode all the time in all kinds of weather and on all surfaces. Uh, she brought one to an artist invites artist residency in Red Lodge, Montana that we did in, in 2013. Um, with Shan, Chandra Glendening and Kyung Hua Oh. Um, we would work all day in the studio, which and it was a beautiful studio, it was a wonderful thing. But Glenda always left some time in the afternoon to go out for a ride uh, at the end of the day. Uh, one day, uh, Glenda got caught in an unanticipated storm, and if you've ever been in the Rockies, you know that that can happen really easily in the afternoon. I got a call from her that said she'd almost been blown off the road, and she was hunkering down in a ditch for protection and she was very apologetic, but wondered if I could go pick her up. So, uh, you know, I, I said, sure, but um, um, by the time I got to her, the storm had passed, uh, the sun was blue again, it, she was soaking wet, but she decided to go on riding and ended up riding another uh, 10 or 20 miles that day. I don't know how many, it was way more than I know I've ever done in my life, but it was, it, well, that was typical Glenda. Glenda completed frequently, competed frequently, and in fact was warming up for the Kansas State Time Trial Championships when she was struck by a passing uh, truck and killed last June, just a few weeks short of her 61st birthday. The bicycle community mourns her loss as much as the Saramus do. I remember one of the things that got me interested in, in serving on the board um, was I began uh, by writing for the journal and I don't even remember exactly but Robert Harrison is someone uh, that I remember connecting with and I would go to a, uh, a session and take notes and we were asked then to submit because all of this was done post-conference submit what we had seen in that session or I would go to a exhibition and I would write about the exhibition and then submit to the journal. So it's handled much differently now, um, but that's what got me first involved with the idea of um, volunteering for the organization. So I think that that level is a good place to begin, is through the volunteer activity and, and seeing how you can serve the organization um, to do our purposes. As a teacher, Glenda always found time for her students and for mentoring friends and colleagues, including myself, who were starting out on their career paths as artists and teachers. She was always proud and excited when her students did well, and she sent numerous students to excellent MFA programs, some of whom are now teaching and mentoring their own students. When I was gathering information for Glenda's nomination for this award, Stephanie Lanter, who uh, as at Emporia State University now, and Linda Ganstrom at Fort Hayes State University, both shared with me how much she had supported and mentored them as they began their teaching year careers. Several former me members of the Enseca board members board also mentioned that Glenda had done a wonderful job of mentoring um, new Enseca board members. And speaking of Enseca, and I think Patsy said a bit about this, an Enseca fellow is chosen based on the individual who has made an outstanding contribution to Enseca and who has served the council in significant ways for at least five years. Glenda was first elected to the Enseca board as director at large in 2008. She became secretary after the membership voted to split it uh, from the treasurer position and therefore helped um, define and model what the role of secretary could and, and should be. I remember sitting in those board meetings thinking, wow, I hope I could just keep up with what they're thinking about, what they're talking about, and the level of professional expertise that's coming in from uh, a variety of sources used to be mostly just uh, sort of college educators who would be on the board, and now we have um, people from all aspects of the ceramic community on the board, so that's exciting. Um, the mission, I think, has become more focused um, and the activities have become more directed towards meeting the mission. During the time she helped develop the complex e-voting process 
and worked with the unglamorous and extremely important <laughs> bylaw revisions that resulted in significant changes to the governing of INSECA. Many former INSECA board members mentioned how organized, thorough, articulate, and prompt Glenda was in recording the minutes of each meeting. Most recently, she was serving as a special INSECA presidential appointee, a commission to work on the development of the plans for this conference here in Kansas City. Among many of the things that she did on this committee, she was organizing the members' ride that many of you, I think, participated in this week. Glenda was a fabulous addition to NSECA and was looking forward to giving more time to the board as she began to plan for her stepping down as chair of the art department. She was loved and cherished and will be sorely missed by her biking friends, by the clay community, by her friends, and of course by her family and her husband Joe, who are here today to uh, help accept this award in her honor. I want everyone to be a little more aware of this connection when you pick up a cup that someone has made, your hand is touching the hand that made it. Um, that's so special, and that kind of connection between people. I want everyone to have that, that sense and understanding. And so that's what I, I think is partly needs to be our focus, is um, increasing awareness from those people who are not aware of ceramics. Well, she's waiting. We can make faces at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite one is always this. <laughs> it's harder and harder to do with my yeah, shoulders right. that work so well anymore. <laughs> These next two awards are for honorary members. These are individuals who've made an outstanding contribution to the professional development of the ceramic arts. This is another award that's posthumous. Um, Nina Hole was a Danish ceramic artist known for her monumental fire sculptures. She's also helped to found the Gilgagard International Ceramics Research Center in Denmark. From one of the letters, Nina's gift to our field is that throughout her career, she has created a space for others to ask new questions regarding art and life. Here to accept the award on her behalf is Craig Hartenberger. We can never fully know the place that someone occupies in our lives until they're gone. And whenever they're gone, we can know them more by observing the space that they leave behind. In Nina's case, this is an incredibly large void. Nina affected people all over the world and had a distinct way of charming everyone that she met. <laughs> Behind her mischievous smile was a powerful creativity and a curiosity which guided her life. Nina rested fully within herself. And because of this, she was content to follow her own path through any amount of doubt or discouragement. To say that Nina profoundly impacted many showcases an insufficiency of our language. It is only with her departure from this world that we can begin to fully understand who she was and just how many people she touched. Through her powerful work, both her small sculptures as well as her monumental fire sculptures, Nina gave us all a chance to experience the world as she saw it a place full of wonder and discovery where nothing should be taken for granted and something could always be learned. There's no singular way to describe who Nina was or what she's done for our field, and it's for this reason that we now all play a part. Going forward, I encourage all who knew Nina and her work to continue to share your experiences to educate those around you about who she was and how vivid she made this world. You guys have already heard enough from me. I recorded this audio this January when I spent some time with Nina and we spoke about Nsika and what this award meant to her. Here's Nina. Well, what I do have to do is to say that 
It was open to me to come and participate and be exposed and meet all the people that that I have been reading about. It was uh, very valuable. It was uh, definitely something that has formed my life at Etsika. I had I had possible to look up to the to the best. I can't imagine where there is such an institution in the rest of the world where you can just walk around and meet the people that you uh, like to uh, talk to or see, uh, you know, uh, and learn from. It's, it's open to you to say, hello, I'm here, and I want to, to talk to you. It really is impressive for, for anybody. I mean, you don't have to be anybody. You just pay your fee and, and you can go and walk among all those people that you, will, that you admire, you know. So for, for me, in CK is a heaven for survivors. And, and you definitely cannot just do that in our in many of our countries because it's they are more restricted. You can't just walk over to anybody's uh, high person and say hello, I'm here from Uruguay or some other place. I mean, of course you have to pay to get there, but but it still is a wonderful opportunity to meet. And and they have been part of my education to meet and talk with all those people. I remember a few years back, I was walking with Jack Troy and uh, our friend Janet Mansfield got an award. And I said, wow, that was beautiful. I think she really deserves it. And then he said, wait, wait, one day you'll get one. <laughs> I said, I think that if people live in America, they don't understand what an opportunity it really is. Mm -hmm. You don't see it like that, of course, well, how could you? And when you are an American student, it costs a lot of money and, 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 and how to step up there and come closer and all that. It's so it's more bothering and it's not a, such an opportunity as it is for us from the outside to have a possibility to meet and get in there among everyone. It's like a fairy tale. <laughs> it is good because it doesn't look like completely impossible to advance in, the, in that field. So it gets people hope that they have, they have the chance to step up on, on the ladder and go there. Don't think that you cannot do it. Just use your uh, energy and your mind, you will do it. You know how, how little it takes to discourage people, playing to how it takes to build up people. I think I met so many positive people while I was in America first time that they never like laughed at me and discouraged mm -hmm. me and mm -hmm. all that that is common in my own country, sort of mocking you a bit if you have too high a thought, that, that I didn't meet here in America. I met the positive side of people mm -hmm. that say, go ahead, go for it. And I was so surprised because that is not common in my country. And you know, since you've been here mm -hmm. now, it is not really a common uh, attitude. So for that reason, it was more than valuable, it sort of made my life. Energy is something that is running and has to be supported to keep running, you know. And if you could if you can furnish that energy to keep running, you get a lot of creativity out of that. And I can remember that myself, I was also full of that stuff when I was young. In spite of many people said, Ah, you can't do it, this is not possible or all that. But when I came among other people that had that spirit, I felt, oh, I'm, I'm okay, I can do it. <laughs> I can't price them enough. I mean, there's a lot of sales and making fun of it and all that sort of thing, but they really have a function. Yeah, and, and, and also I think that the uh, 
ability to, to have, make a party out of it. That's important too. Thank you guys for Nina. The second recipient of the Honorary Members Award uh, Stuart Kestenbaum was the director of Haystack Mountain School of Crafts for 27 years. From one of his letters, um, Ted Kuser, a former U.S. Poet Laureate, has written, quote, Stuart Kestenbaum writes the kind of poems I love to read, heartfelt responses to the privilege of having been given a life. No hidden agendas here, no theories to espouse, nothing but life, pure life, set down with craft and love. Stuart Kestenbaum. Can you hear me all right? I'm a soft speaker. Um, it seemed very fitting to me to, to uh, receive this award. I'm, I'm so honored. But to have it be in Kansas City, where I came to my first NSICA back in 1989. I had just started my job at the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts in Deer Isle, Maine, about five months before. I knew one person here, Lynn Durier. I was wearing an overcoat, and it was 80 degrees in Kansas City that day, so I was like just sweating. And then I came here, there are 4,000 people or so, which is 1,000 more people than live in Deer Isle. So it, it's a kind of a shock, you know, when you come here. And, uh, and the first person I met was Linda Christensen, who was gonna be teaching a workshop at Haystack that summer, and she greeted me so warmly, even though I was a sweaty guy from Maine. And, uh, and really welcomed me into this community. And then the next person was Jerry Williams from Studio Potter, who gave me, Haystack didn't have a table at that time, and illegally, I believe, gave me a corner of the Studio Potter table to put our, our catalogs on. And then I went to the Nelson Atkins Museum, and there was a wonderful show there that Wayne Higby and Warren McKenzie had co-curated of work from the collection, and they had each written about what they picked out their favorite pieces from the collection and wrote about them. And I was so amazed at the, how articulate they were, their love of the history of ceramics and, and of the tradition. And, and I, so I really love this new community that I've become a part of. In a way, it was kind of a homecoming for me because in college, I'd taken one ceramics course. And I would show you those images, but you'd all you'd be running out the doors now if you, if you saw them. But uh, I'd been a comparative religion major, a great major if you want to get a job. And, uh, and I took the ceramics course. I'd been thinking about the cosmos and the planet, and here I was in this course where I could like, really touch the earth and get my hands dirty, and I, I really liked it. So after graduating, um, knowing that I wasn't going to get a job anyhow, and not really as a comparative religion major, they just weren't looking for many people to talk about the cosmos, I was washing dishes in a restaurant in Portland, Maine. I saw an ad for a, a pottery apprentice, and there used to be newspapers that had ads in them, and I saw the ad, and I. I got the job. There was one other person applying. I was very quick at making beads. That was my secret. And uh, so I was there for about a year. And, uh, and Larry Adlerstein, who was uh, the potter, said to me, you know, you should go. My time was just about up with him. He said, you should go to a place like, like Penland or Haystack. Uh, you know, that would really kind of complete your education. So I chose Haystack. It was closer because it was in Maine. And also because in the course brochure, the potter I studied with was George Cummings. And M.C. Richards had written he throws like an angel. So being a comparative religion major, I mean, to study with an angel, plus you know, being a writer, I just like the simile of it. So I took the course, and I, I learned a lot. I learned about, I tried new firing techniques. I stayed up late. I got in a slip fight of enormous proportions, and I, my hair was about three times as long with dreads. So it was memorable all around. But, but most importantly, I became part of a community. So, so when I returned to Haystack as its director, and, uh, probably 15 years later, I already knew the power of the studio, the, the impact of working in a studio. And some of you who know me might think that my favorite thing about Haystack is the wastewater system. 
but, but really it was just before a session would begin would be to, to go through the studios before anybody was there and it was just empty space, just pure potential and how every session people come in and inhabit it and bring it to life and the kind of energy that, that's in that studio uh, it was really the tr tradition of Haystack. It's really the blank slate and you can be explorers when you're there and that's, there's no hierarchy, that's how it works. And I just loved witnessing that. I liked going to all the studios, a pottery studio, watching weavers, glass blowers, jewelers, blacksmiths, woodworkers, and how they would come to know the material with their hands. And I began to see words as a kind of material. The great thing about words is they never dry out. You can't overfire them, you can misuse them. But, you, but I could see that I could work with words the same way people could work with clay. And you have to know the history of the words, the etymology, the sound of it. And I, I began to see that as a, a correlation with Haystack. And I wanted to involve writers with Haystack. So I began to invite writers to be part of the community. And I think it was good for potters to hear writers have their process, but then also uh, for writers to see people work with their hands. So I just liked the connection. And so following that, I began to involve other people, including architects and scientists and philosophers, choreographers. Liz Lerman, who was the keynote speaker, was in, has been involved with probably five or six projects at Haystack. And uh, I think it just gave everybody a different view of the world. And, and in the early 2000s, we began to look at digital technology. And so I, uh, I had a, developed a symposium with the Media Lab at MIT. And we had, uh, at that point, I thought there was there would be like, like uh, families at a wedding that aren't going to get along, the potters and the, and the physicists. And, and during that time, we had uh, people in the studios. Some people worked in digital technology and other people worked with their hands. So we partnered Bill Daly with the person, uh, 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 Mandayam Srinivasan, who's head of the Touch Lab at MIT. And they were in the clay studio together and, and Bill, wrote and uh, uh, took uh, masking tape and wrote MIT, M-U-D. And, uh, and, and I thought, well, you know, this could really be bad, but it wasn't. It was actually great. And, and late one night, uh, Tom Joyce, the MacArthur Award-winning blacksmith, was working with Justine Cassell, who works with narrative psychology. And they were making a vessel that told of its own making. And so they were having a computer program to show the story of what the forging was doing. And I'm in the studio around 11.30 at night, and there's the red fire of the forge, and it's like the most primitive human impulse of making change with material and, and iron. And then right next to them, these, these grad students from MIT working on their laptops with this blue light. And I thought at that moment, it's not either or, it's both and, and it's like a continuum of, of knowledge and ingenuity and creativity. And to me, um, it really speaks to our survival, and it was a, a really a, amazing moment. And at the same time, though, I think it's really important, like an organization like Haystack on its small island, bringing in people from all over the world, that you don't hover over the place that you're part of, that you become a part of your community. So concurrent with having these uh, international programs, uh, I wanted to provide, have programs that provided the same quality to our local community. So we developed a mentor program for kids that's fully endowed. Uh, programs for community-based residencies, like Liz came in. We did a big dance project for the entire town of Deer Isle with her dancers and our community members. And also working in the same way throughout Maine. And for me, like what unites the high school students who come to our program and the physicists and the beginners and the advanced professionals is really that uninterrupted time in the studio. That's really at the heart of it. And a few years ago, we asked uh, high school kids are at our program, how would you just compare Haystack to high school? And this one girl wrote, well, in high school, if you mess up, you can't start over again, but here you can start over again. And, uh, and I think that's really the essence of it. You can start over again. So I'm very grateful for my time at Haystack. Uh, it's a, it was a perfect place to make the kind of community that we have there. Uh, I was really thankful for the vision of Fran Merritt, Haystack's founding director, who's also, I believe, an honorary fellow something. He's big. He's not alive anymore, but he's still big. And Fran would always look for connections to the outside world in a big way, and I, I really responded to that. The Haystack board members who helped inform my thinking about the programming, half of them, more than half of them are artists or teachers, and I really benefited from their knowledge. 
the amazing staff who are multi-talented and energetic, uh, who make things happen. My wife and two sons, Susan Webster and Isaac and Sam, who had to put up with dad coming home late at night, but got a kick out of the totally zany people at Haystack and would retrieve things from under the deck. Uh, kept me sane for at least probably 25 of the 27 years. And uh, the, the insane part wasn't like two years in a row, it was like different parts during the 27 years. And, uh, and mostly to the people who come and inhabit the studios at Haystack, who bring with them a willingness to just give it a go and stay up late at night, get up early in the morning to make sure that happens. So last year I decided to leave uh, my, uh, my job at Haystack. It really felt like it was time for me to move on. I wanted to take some of the ideas that I developed there out into the world. So this last year I've been working as a strategist for, with a consortium of schools, Aramont, Peters Valley, Haystack, Penland, and Pilchuck, to let people know how important this educational model is and to help shape its future. And I've also been leading writing workshops with art school students because I think they shouldn't be afraid of writing the thesis. They should see it as a joy and we're making small progress in that joyous process. Um, and as a writer, I just uh, w would be inspired by seeing things going on around the school and would sometimes write poems in response to that, that work. Uh, it was very important for me to see, and people would sometimes give me work that I could write about. And to me, with all creative processes, there are two parts. There's the how and the why, and everybody can get pretty good at the how, you know how to make things. And then the question is why? Why are you making things? And everybody's answer is different. But for me, it, it, it comes down to uh, that we, that it's our, you know, my obligation to in some way repair the world in some way I can and, and perhaps to invoke the holiness of the small moments of our lives. So a few years ago, Kate Rhodes, the glassblower, asked me to write a catalog essay, but she said, why don't you write a poem instead of an essay? So fewer words is easier, you know, poems are easy. And uh, that's a joke, poems are easy. And uh, <laughs> anyhow, she made this Marini vessel, so small pieces all stitched together with copper. So I'd like to close with this poem that I wrote uh, in response to that work. It's called Holding the Light. Gather up whatever is glistening in the gutter, whatever has tumbled in the waves or fallen in flames out of the sky. For it's not only our hearts that are broken, but the heart of the world as well. Stitch it back together. Make a place where the day speaks to the night and the earth speaks to the sky. Whether we created God or God created us, it all comes down to this. In our imperfect world, we are meant to repair and stitch together what beauty there is. Stitch it with compassion and wire. See how everything we have made gathers the light inside itself and overflows a blessing. Thank you. The Excellence in Teaching Award is for individuals near or at the end of a career dedicated to the practice of teaching. They shall have demonstrated excellence in their own creative work, shall have previous recognition for and a history of awards in teaching, and should have highly visible former students in the field. Victor Babu was an integral part of the faculty at the Kansas City Art Institute beginning in 1968, retiring in 2002 from one of his letters. Behind his monumental passions and his operatic gestures hangs a measuring stick of infinite length by which he measures himself as an artist and teacher. That standard has motivated and carried hundreds of his students and fueled Victor's own aesthetic pursuits. And just this one more, it was so beautiful. Uh, with the greatest respect, admiration, and love, I tell you that without teachers like Victor Babu, there would be less beauty in the world. So to accept the award on his behalf is Matt Long. Well, with all this technology in the world, I thought I'd bring my whole thing right up here. 
paper was too easy. Uh, <clears throat> well, it's, for me, listen, it's a complete honor to be up here, to be asked to be here. I think there's a lot of people in the room, and I know there's a lot of people at the conference that clearly have been affected by this human being. For me to be up here today with you is wonderful. And I thought about maybe going through the compendium of Victor things, but there's too many. And Victor is still here. He's just not right here. So I want to talk about him that way. As you guys notice in these slides here, you notice that Victor did beautiful things in the world. He did beautiful things with his hands. He did beautiful things with his body. And he did beautiful things to students. He changed people's lives in a way that's really not comprehensible unless you were one of those people. I'm happy to tell you that I was one of those people. When Carrie asked me to write a letter in response to who Victor was and whether he should receive an award like this, I thought about how this should read. And usually I wouldn't probably take the time to read a letter to you. But I think this will make things a little clearer. In 1992, I arrived in Kansas City with my wife, Carrie, of two weeks, a cat, and a bed. Our two and a half days of travel from Northern California found us arriving in a place we had never been before with weather we never imagined possible and seemingly no one to guide us on our way. The above statement is important because it describes my reality at the time in which I entered the BFA program at the Kansas City Art Institute. I was, <clears throat> I was scared unsure, alone in there, and outnumbered. And then I met Victor. You know, great teachers often go unnoticed in the public. They move through the world affecting greatly their captive audience, which is the students, and that's in the classroom. However, this was not necessarily the case for Victor. And yeah, he taught everybody at the Kansas City Art Institute. He's there were always people around him, and people around him were simply better because of his presence. Victor was more than a professor of art. He taught beyond the classroom. He taught about history. He taught about people, about life, and taught us in a way that was undeniably beautiful. Victor's presence, excuse me, Victor's process of teaching was so pure and so real, you could not escape the power of potential that he gave you. He didn't really teach to impress, but if you know Victor, that's all he did. He taught to impress. But the impress was not about Victor. It was for you. His approach could leave you feeling like you'd just been awarded the Nobel Prize, but then you realize you didn't, hadn't even written a book. Victor's voice was so supportive it made you feel competent and empowered. For me to be a 21-year-old kid that played in the mud from the Sierra Nevada mountains, being thrown into a private art school held as the number one school in the United States for ceramics, I knew I didn't fit that mold. Yet Victor's voice somehow seemed to level the playing field. Victor's love for people, all of them, students, administrators, cooks, janitors, ditch diggers, everyone. He loved them, and he let you know. Victor accepted me as his assistant in 1992, and I joyfully, but with some hesitation, took on this challenge. Every assistant simply does not want to mess up. <laughs> and I said, oh, I was nervous. And nor had I ever seen a platter that large before. And Victor says to me, do you know how to turn that over to trim it? And before I could say anything, he began to answer. It was clear that he had a plan. 
leave no stone unturned. Teach them everything and give them the ability to be armed with confidence. This requires teaching, love, giving, passion. This is how Victor taught his students. I've been fortunate to have remarkable teachers in my life, but Victor may be the reason that today I find success in my art, in my classroom, and in my life. My approach is clearly modeled after my experience of education from Victor. His intentions were not to create artists, but to foster the potential of one's ability to make art, to see life, to see the world, and maybe then you could be artful. Victor taught me that teaching is not about meeting the standard. It's about striving for more. It's about challenging what you think you know and being open and understanding enough to accept the differences in people. And because of this, you might really learn something. Victor never told you the answers. He simply stated that you must seek the questions and from what you will find will be the answers. He taught me that failure was imminent, but without it, success was not an attainable thing. Victor taught me to see, to understand form, surface, and beauty. He would, gra he would gasp with joy when he realized you finally got it and would press on until you did. Victor's presence in my life and career has been one of great strength. He empowered me with confidence and love. He has always given to me in an unconditional way and seemingly to anyone who comes in contact with him. And again, this includes everyone. Now as an associate professor at the University of Mississippi, tenured and beginning my 11th year of teaching, I'm reminded at every corner, every project, every kid that walks into my classroom that doesn't fit the mold, of what Victor has taught me. And if I am really a professor, if I am really a teacher, then these students will be armed with that confidence who they are, that success and failure reside together. And if they can learn to see, they have the potential to be artful in their lives. With the greatest respect and admiration and love, I tell you that without people teachers like Victor, Babu, the world would be less beautiful. I also have a quick, <laughs> I have a quick statement that Victor asked me to read. It's a letter he wrote to Patsy in response to receiving this award. He says, Dear Patsy, I thank you and the members of the board for your faith in awarding me this remarkable honor. Please know that I will hold this award in trust to share with those who are my educators. They include my family, teachers, colleagues, and most importantly, the students whose work inspired and challenged. They all helped me grow as an educator, an artist, and a human being. We have, all of us, been so fortunate to walk a road that has made our lives an adventure. I salute my high school ceramics teacher, Ilsa Finch, who put me on that road. With my fondest regards, Victor Babu. Any, any last words for, for your students that are out there? Or any? <clears throat> No, they have the last word. They have the last word. They have the last word always. There is, a, it is, when I was looking, when I was looking at some magazines, even yesterday, you know, or National Geographic, you know, and you, it is endless. The, what human beings come up with daily, I mean, on a daily basis, and begin to conjure up to express as important in their life, it just goes on and on and on, you know, and there never is, it, it's kind of like people that are not artists sometimes say, are you doing anything that's different? And they don't understand. They think, they think that means that you're switching from a pretzel to a balloon, you know, or something completely, you know, alien, one from the other, but that's not the way it is. 
you know, Ferguson and uh, uh, many, many potters, of course, say, you know, the first pot makes the second pot, which makes the third, and it goes on and on and on, and you enjoy it for what it is, and whatever changes take place, do. And you don't panic, you just do it, you enjoy it. But that's it. Thank you, Victor. Yeah. Thank you. The Outstanding Achievement Award recognizes individuals who have successfully completed a singular project that has contributed to the field of ceramic arts in an extraordinary way. The scope of the venture should be above and beyond what would typically be considered his or her professional responsibilities. Linda Lighton is an artist advocate and activist for the arts. She's also the administrator of the Lighton International Artists Exchange Program, which is celebrating its 15th anniversary. From one of the letters, the mission that Linda established for the exchange program is simple but profound, seeking to fund U.S. artists traveling to international residencies and to facilitate international artist exchange to the U.S. Since being initiated in 2000, the program has funded the exchange of over 120 artists to and from 46 countries. From another note, Lighten personifies the Mark Twain quote, Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Linda Lighton. Hi, I'm glad you guys are here today. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Ensika, for this award. I'm so honored to be receiving it. Have I emerged yet? I'm trying, man. So this is the 15th year of the Lighten International Artist Exchange Program has been realized. We have actually sent at least 137 artists to 52 countries, the Arctic Circle, and six continents. Uh, 59 of those artists are ceramic artists, so you can see where my heart is. I'll tell you how I had the idea for this project. I was challenged by the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation to just dream, do something bigger than you can do, um, something that could have some impact on some people's lives. So as an artist, I started to think about what's important to me. Respect would be it. Uh, to make great art, I want to be able to reach across borders and relate to all people. Travel is an important way for an artist to understand other cultures. It can enhance our mythology, and a prize would be nice, huh? I didn't want to squeeze anyone and barely give them enough money to make it, maybe even enough money to pay their house payment while they're gone or their rent. So my work, particularly, is always focused on transition. How can we look at things in a new light? How can we make change attractive? It's inevitable. How can we do it with grace and style? So traveling can introduce one to a new reality. I want to relate visually across borders to create the most potent and cogent work that I can. I need to understand the scale, the smells, the sounds and colors of another culture. I need to understand if red is the color of death, marriage, communism, fire, what is it? So in 1991, I was invited by Lakeside to go to Latvia to what had been the former Soviet Artists' Union. I was really shocked to see 60 artists working together from around the world. There was room enough for everybody to have their own room and everybody got their own studio space and nobody made any money. So the goal was just to exchange ideas. I was knocked out. 
In the U.S., someone always has to be making money. Somebody has to teach or something. It would be so great just to make better art. Foment ideas, exchange thinking about your work, and see how people from other countries are relating. I don't want to offer a warm bath. Once you're out of your comfort level, when you can't read the writing or talk to anybody on the street, you see things as if for the first time. Materials, colors, scale, the song and cadence of a language can take on new meaning. So I have felt that travel is a great way to broaden your horizons and to feed yourself artistically. Our artists can be great ambassadors. We speak a language without words. Imagine just one person at a time going to make friends in another country. Gee, you can make world peace. <laughs> just one artist ta talking to making friends. So I want to thank really all the artists that have gone on this journey with me. and You've made the program what it is today. Erica Jung says, when everything is fresh and new and having a halo around it, like the moon on a wintry night, for a stranger that walks in a new land, every ordinary thing pierces the heart and can change your life. Befriending other artists working towards a common goal and exchanging ideas expands and enriches a life. A byproduct is that we can understand other cultures better. We can put a face on America that's not what is seen in the news. Um, democracy um, takes responsibility. It's not necessarily a new washing machine. I think Americans need to understand this too. And I think that the greatest thing that Americans have to offer is our great sense of optimism. The idea that we can accomplish our goals. So artists are terrific ambassadors. My goal is to encourage community, hope, and dynamism. We can break down barriers and promote world peace and cultural cooperations, just one friend at a time. So some exceptional things have happened. I won't tell you all of them, but this is one of them. <laughs> Maybe you saw it. Um, I sent Jane Ingram Allen, who's a fiber artist, I think she's about 80 now, to do some research on some fiber in Tanzania. So she got to this incredibly impoverished residency, which actually was four poles and a tarp over the top and closed for lunch while they had a pizza restaurant. <laughs> and they were getting paper from Denmark. And they're in Tanzania, and she's like, what's going on here? So looking further, she found that there was no paper in the entire school system for the country. She went to a nearby uh, school and got the principal together and a few of the students. She found a nursery that picked up banana leaves for a resort. And the most difficult thing was to find a big barrel or something strong enough that could handle the lye and the organic matter. Um, so she showed them how to make paper. They, and this school is now making paper for the entire school system of the country. And now that school is helping the next country over to make paper for, the, for their school system also. It's pretty cool. James Ferguson, a 19th century Scottish architect, says travel is more important than a visitor seeing sights. It's the profound changing, the deep and permanent understanding of the visitor's perspective of the world and his or her own place in it. So I want to thank my husband, Lynn Adkins, who's the best advisor in the world and is so altruistic. Who's ever been on a grant, they can thank him. I want to thank my daughter, Rose Durgan, so um, she gives great advice, juring skills and moral support. And thank you, Ms. D. Gamble, B.D. Clark, and Lori Antouchette for nominating me for this award. Thank you, Nsika. You've been such a wonderful part of my life. I think I've been to 34 Nsika conferences. They always give me a boost for my work. And it's so great to see so many old friends here and meet new comrades every time. Thank you. Thank you. These are the last two. 
We have two awards, uh, Regional Award of Excellence. These are for outstanding contributions to the ceramic arts within this community or region. The first recipient, recipients of this award, Bill and Anne of Bracker's Good Earth Clay Fame, have worked hard to build a lasting legacy within the region. They've been incredibly supportive of Ensika. From one of the letters, over the years I've felt welcomed by the extended Bracker family. In fact, they have made me feel like part of their family. The Brackers have always been there for me and I appreciate them more than they will likely ever know. In addition to my personal experience with Bill and Ann Bracker, I have watched how they have interacted and supported the ceramics community as a whole. Um, Ann Bracker. I want to thank the Enseca Board for bestowing this award upon Bill and me. It is indeed special to be recognized for something you love being a part of. The ceramic community is like no other. I also want to thank my three special friends who wrote letters of support, Stephen Hill, Pete Pinnell, and Joe Smith. Bill was the first person I saw throw on the wheel. He was my mentor. Much like meeting him was love at first sight, Clay was love at first touch. I married him, left my Texas roots, and followed him to Indiana and Purdue University. While Bill was teaching at Purdue, he drove to Toronto with Richard Beeler then president of Enseca for that year's conference. When he came home, he was so excited to tell me all about the potters, the makers, and professors, the mentors, who gathered together to share their knowledge, tips, experiences, and expertise. For him, it was a milestone. The next year, the conference was in Gatlingburg, and Bill and I traveled there with our three-week-old daughter. Richard Peeler babysat so that we could go to the dance together, where I saw Paul Soldner streak. <laughs> For me, that was a definite milestone. <laughs> At another conference of Enseca, or rather on the plane trip home, Bill met Sheldon Carey, who was retiring from the University of Kansas and he invited Bill to apply for the job, which led to our family's relocation to Lawrence in 1975. A year later, our second daughter was born. Bill often bragged that his two daughters were the most creative and wonderful things he'd ever made, and I completely agree, since I had something to do with it too. During the summer of 1975, we transitioned from university life and into Brocker Ceramics. We moved into our pottery studio, a 60-foot stucco teepee, which had originally been a gas station built in 1929. We threw pots, had a small gallery inside, and built a shed and a salt kiln in the back. I think the saying is that you kind of have to be crazy to be a potter. It's a challenging life financially. Certainly, we all know that. Being a salt potter added an additional financial burden of replacing shelves corroded by the salt, not to mention the wear and tear on the kiln that meant it frequently had to be rebuilt, and often just when the results were that their most spectacular. I guess you could say that you have to be truly insane to do salt, but we always thought it was worth it. These are a few examples of our insanity. Bill and I were members of the Lawrence Potters Guild and enjoyed during their sale every October. I was treasurer of the guild for about five years, mainly because I had some accounting background, I loved counting money, and nobody else wanted the job. 
In addition to the Lawrence Potter's Guild sale, we always enjoyed being involved in Lawrence's Art in the Park every May. It is truly a community affair. When we were joined into the Plaza Art Fair, it was a big boost to sales. Galleries started to come to us for our work. We felt it was very important to provide a bit of education with our pots, so we created this small card that explained the salt firing process to people who bought our ware. We would often tell them there'd be a pop quiz next time we'd run into them. Bill was frequently called upon to be a juror for various shows, and he began to notice that a slide was not an accurate representation of the actual piece, and he lamented the, that he had to jury a three-dimensional work from a two-dimensional image. Though he loved his larger work, he also enjoyed making miniature pots and conceived of the idea of a show of miniature ceramic work. Because gas kilns were so ubiquitous at the time, and knowing that most, if not all, potters would probably have at least one empty box of standard cones, he decided a cone box would be the perfect measurement device to ensure a maximum size of a work for this new show. And with encouragement from Richard Peeler and Lee Ferber and support from the Orton Ceramic Foundation, the Kohnbach Show was born. Bill and I were founding members of the KC Clay Guild, then called the Kansas City Potters Group. For over a decade, I personally, as well as my company, was happy to financially support the KC Clay Guild's scholarship competition for high school seniors which they had even named after Bill. A portion of every member's fee went to the scholarship fund. One of our current employees was a second place recipient of the award in 2004. After less than a decade as, stu potter, as studio potters, a need for a clay supplier arose and Bill and I rose to meet that challenge. We needed more space than the TP could provide so we bought a warehouse and created our first new catalog, complete with a hand-drawn map showing the new location a quarter mile north of the teepee. As we began to sell and deliver supplies to schools, Bill was often late getting back from a delivery because he was drawn into helping into the classroom. I would often have to call the school to track him down. Reports indicated that he would hear the phone ringing in the art room pack up his stuff, dash out the door, hollering behind him, tell her I left 15 minutes ago. Education continues to be an important part of our business mission as our local community continues to expand its embrace of clay. We too aim to expand our offerings, always considering the needs of this clay ecosystem of which we are all a part. One of my favorite things to do has always been to load up my potter's wheel, clay, and tools and do demonstrations at schools. And we present district-wide professional development seminars and RACU workshops with students. We, pro we provide educational opportunities for all clay lovers in the area with our free Second Saturday series and generous sharing of information and technical expertise from the beginner to the well vitrified. That commitment to serving the field of ceramic art education also manifests in exhibiting and presenting at state art education conferences. And of course, exhibiting at Enseca is always an educational experience. This was the education we had in Las Vegas. We also loved to find and give out free tools a tradition that goes back to Bill and finding the little chiseler and thinking what a great rib this is. It was our first giveaway tool until Stephen Hill discovered it, loved it, and kept telling people about it at workshops he did. Eventually, we had to start selling them. But if you check under your chair, you may find one of these little chiselers. I had elves here. Here are a few of our other giveaways over the years. How many do you have? After Bill died, 
we found a way to honor his memory. Since December 1st, his birthday of 1995, we have donated a pottery wheel to a variety of schools, art centers, institutions, and universities. Each of these locations have had some connection to Brockers or Bill specifically. But it's time to move beyond these ties. For this year, we are inviting programs to make their case to be the recipient of the Bill Brocker Memorial Wheel. Details would be on our website, brockers.com. As I said earlier, as a business, we aim to provide what our community needs. I am very excited about our newest endeavor. My two daughters, my son-in-law, and I recently formed a new company called Kansas Clay, who will be the new manufacturer Factor of Flint Hills Clays. With this formation, I'm looking forward to expanding and expanding Brockers Good Earth Clays ability to serve the ceramic needs of this region and strengthen support for an awareness of clay within the community. I've heard it's Ensika's mission to leave behind a footprint in the communities they visit. I am grateful to Ensika for choosing Kansas City as the host for its 50th anniversary conference. Its presence here has definitely elevated the field of ceramics. I see it as my duty to take that ball of clay and run with it or throw with it. Either way, I see great things on the horizon here in Kansas City and the surrounding area, and I am thrilled to be a part of it all. Thank you. The second recipients of the Regional Award of Excellence, Richard Belger and Evelyn Kraft Belger are Kansas City community leaders who've worked behind the scenes in support of many of the experiences that you're having both inside the Convention Center and out in the community. This is a snippet from a letter um, from a writer who had made a visit to them. And it, this was our observation. This was a community where the whole had become as important as the individual, where the accomplishments of others were as much a source of pride as one's own achievements. And it was clear the Belgers were part of its engine, leading not by taking center stage, but by driven, devoted example. Richard and Evelyn Kraft Belger. We're going to tag team you a little bit, and we're not going to be long because I know we're the last ones. But wow, what a conference and what an amazing group of honorees and talented and extraordinary and accomplished people. And we thank you all for what you've done and thank you for including us in this group. We are touched and honored by this recognition and uh, would like to thank the NSECA board, of course but particularly want to thank the four extraordinary women who nominated us. Carrie Esser, who is the chair of the Department of Ceramics at KCAI. Julie Haynes, who is the senior editor at American Craft Magazine. Catherine Footer, who's the director of curatorial affairs at the Nelson Atkins. And Rain Harris, an extraordinary and accomplished artist. It is probably an overused expression but it truly takes a team to create a, and sustain a vibrant, mission-driven organization. Dick and I married later in life when we were both well along in our own art center lives. Together, we've been able to combine his discipline collecting vision with my pro, pa, uh, passion for the process of creating something extraordinary. And that's whether it's dance, film, glass, or clay. 
We both believe in the universal language of art as a window to the human condition. And we believe we can each learn as we watch the artist's approach to problem solving and expression. Since this is in SICA, we're gonna focus on the development and transition of Red Star Studios into the Belger Crane Yard Studio and Gallery. I'd like to first acknowledge Stephen and Susan Hill's contribution as the founders of Red Star in the former Red Star Yeast Building. We are retaining the Red Star name as, as for our residency program and to honor that beginning. And as we're unifying our endeavors in, with the Art Center and the studios um, into the Belger Crane Yard Studios. Integral to the early decisions and continued success of both the Belger Art Center and the Crane Yard Red Star Studios were a couple of other people. Mo Dickens. How many of you have met Mo Dickens? Well, then you know what, <laughs> what an extraordinary and unique individual Mo is. He's impossible to define. Also critical was someone many of you may not know, but it's Frank Kraft who is my son and he has had to overcome that unfortunate label, which is that SOB label, which is son of boss. He moved to Kansas City for a year and a half with his young family to help develop the infrastructure and continues to commute from Florida today. Um, and most important though, he's helped to manage the cultural change of melding two groups of people with different habits and histories and not just combining the groups, but merging two identities into one with energy and passion for a broader mission. Other key people we want to recognize include Michael Baxley, who's the gallery manager of the Belcher Crane Yard Studio Gallery, Brock DeBoer with his unending energy, Tommy Frank, our studio manager, and a host of others, including Sidney Ross, Consuelo Cruz, Kelly Seward, and Cheryl Toe. And there are a couple of early residents, Ryan Fletcher and Stephanie Cantor, who deserve particular recognition as well. They did backbreaking work full time in the beginning and still managed to create extraordinary art and art experiences. Finally, before I turn it over to Dick, who's going to have the last word as usual, I'd like to acknowledge a few other people. I've been inspired in my lifetime. Um, and been lucky enough to be involved in creative endeavors in Memphis, Tennessee and in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. And I've been inspired um, by, these, by some ex really outstanding people who have made a lifetime commitment to the arts and supporting the arts. One of those is Beth Morian and another is Catherine Howe, who is here, both of whom live in my former hometown of St. Petersburg and they're dedicated and, and committed supporters of the arts in all forms. They live what they believe. And as another continuation of this conference, I'd like to make a very special acknowledgement to another um, studio potter with years of history and talent. And her name is Agnes Stark, and she's from Memphis, Tennessee. And she probably wouldn't be here if she knew I was gonna say this, but she is. She was my first exposure to the power of a of beautiful functioning, um, functional work to enrich lives. She was a friend of my mother's, and I was lucky as a child to learn by watching Agnes and, and appreciate her studio discipline, as well as her ability to turn a coffee mug into a gorgeous uh, sculptural object. Thank you, Agnes. And then finally, my thanks to each of you for your commitment and to art education and to continued growth as both artists and as human beings. Because I believe that, with, that each one of you as well as each one of us have the ability to change a life one, with one experience. And we may not be aware of what that is, but something that we do or something that someone observes can have a lifetime of impact on, on the world. So thank each of you. Well, as usual, I got upstaged by craft, and uh, I had this long list of people to thank, and she thanked them all. So I'm going to turn it a little bit and talk about something uh, that we really haven't talked about, and I want to accept this honor, and it is an honor, in all of your names. 
because unfortunately sometimes we get caught up in the thing and the artists themselves kind of gets a little pushed into the background. You know, in thinking about it, art is a very, very strong thing. And we don't talk about it. We never do. But it's that little thing that lives inside of you that pushes that medium forward. So I'd like to thank all of you, whether you're a potter or whether you're a sculptor or whatever you are, for pushing this medium forward. Stop and think about your little Inseca conferences a few years back and look at what they're doing today. There's a major, major change. It's that education. I like to think of it this way. Uh, you know, if you're learning, you're still alive. If you're not learning, you're dead. Literally or figuratively. That's the end of it. And it's pushing that medium forward that makes Enseca great and makes these conferences worthwhile. It's nice to be in an atmosphere where there's no paranoia about discovering someone else's secret. Because if there's any secrets, or it must be really good, because I don't know them. Uh, and I think everybody is, there's a free flow of information, and that's tremendous. Somebody told me one time, I can't remember who, because I'd love to attribute it, maybe some of you know and can tell me, making art is an act of courage. It doesn't seem like much to say that, but it really is. And there are a few other disciplines that takes that type of courage to get out there and push an idea through. It may not work the first time, it may not work the second time, but you keep doing it. That's what makes us progress and better ourselves and raise that standard and raise that bar. So I'd like to thank all of you as artists who came to Kansas City, and I'd like to thank you for coming to Kansas City and making our city a better place. Thank you.